All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining this Living Inc. webinar. My name is Jenna Gallegos, I'm with Samba Scientific, and I'll be the moderator today. In this webinar, Dr. Scott Fulbright from Living Inc. is going to share the story of how algae black, an eco-friendly pigment alternative to carbon black, started as an idea between two grad school friends and became the basis of a successful startup. So without further delay, I will go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Fulbright. Thanks a lot, Jenna. Um, let's share the screen. All right, well, uh, yeah, thank you, Jenna. My name's Scott Fulbright. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Living Inc. Uh, where we're developing the future of black using carbon negative materials. And so um, I'll just walk you through um, kind of my journey and how I got here um, and uh, talk, you, talk to you a little bit about what where we've, where we've been and, and where we are and, and kind of where we're going in this journey. Um, as Jenna mentioned, my background, PhD, and I'll get into that a little bit, um, but now doing all the business development. So um, as a uh, kind of a, an intro or what I just kind of said is, uh, this, I don't know if you've ever had any of these moments before where you wonder like, what, why are you doing what you're doing today? Or how did you end up in this position? But this is a picture of me several years ago. It's at a packaging show in Paris. And I was walking to the show and I was carrying all of my boxes and printed goods with the algae ink product that we make. And, uh, and then I had a flask of algae in my hand and I'm like, this is a very unusual mix of materials here. And, and I kind of sat down at this chair and said, you know, how did I end up in Paris at a packaging show carrying a flask of algae? Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I kind of, this is what went through my head is that um, when I was probably 18, uh, first summer after undergrad, uh, I ended up teaching sailing in California I fell in love with the ocean, the biodiversity that exists out there. Um, both in the kind of the kelp beds to the mammals, to even the microscopic organisms um, that we were learning about. And so when I went back to uh, back to the my, back to university, which was Michigan State, I uh, ended up getting a job in an algal ecology laboratory. And so we ended up studying algae down in the Florida freshwater spring systems. And so um, this is usually what the springs look like. They're beautiful, huge source of tourism, huge source of of of, of water. Um, and um, uh, an abundance of um, wildlife um, in terms of kind of the, the preservation that they've done to, to, uh, to, to make the, uh, the, this a, a beautiful space for, uh, for wildlife. And so what ends up happening is uh, uh, these algae blooms would come in here and this algae blooms would basically kill wildlife, um, cause human health issues. And so it would shut down tourism, it would clog pipes. And um, this is... Uh, uh, really, really kind of shows how science kind of can, can impact the regular, the regular world. And so I fell in love with the algae world. Um, I was down there for a month straight taking samples and I went back to, back to university um, after that and ended up, you know, counting cells. And so these are algae cells under a microscope and fell in love with this kind of microbial universe and all the action that was going on under there. And as I looked at these cells, you kind of think there's gotta be things that we can do with, with algae. It's so different. Um, uh, th there's gotta be something we can do to kind of benefit uh, society and, and really kind of apply it to, um, to our, our, our day-to-day -day world. And so um, studied in this lab for a while. My first job at undergrad, um, it was a dream job. It was going down, down to New Mexico and Texas where we were growing algae for biofuels. So these are little 10 inch ponds with a little paddle wheel and moves the algae around and uh, the algae divide every single day and were harvested and turned into um, bio crude oil. So um, tons of opportunities here. I think there's still a lot of opportunity here, although it's a very nascent industry. Um, I think people forget that our traditional crops have been studied for thousands of years. And algae is still a kind of a, a, um, a non-domesticated um, feedstock is what I would call it. So tons of opportunity. I, uh, I, I wanted to go back and learn more about the technology and, and really learn about science. So we come up with other innovations. So I went to grad school at Colorado State University. Um, this is actually a picture of me um, with, uh, with my friend the first day of PhD. We both got degrees in cell and molecular biology. We shook hands, we became fast friends, and we said, you know, let's use microbes to make the world a better place, um, specifically transition um, off of fossil fuels. We know, you know, whether it's climate change or toxicity, we know that we're going to run out of this finite material and we're going to start innovating solutions uh, today. And so 
Um, this is my co-founder, Steve Albers. Um, we have been, we've known each other for about 14 years now. We started the company halfway through our uh, PhDs. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, this is, this was first day of, of PhDs. But when we went back to the laboratory after, you know, symposiums like this, um, we were always looking at Petri dishes with algae or flasks full of algae. And so um, my mind was always going, you know, what's the really high tech things we can do with these this microbial sources of material um, from genetic engineering to um, selecting, um, you know, cells with so cell sorting uh, to uh, to even like, uh, you know, uh, uh, biomarkers for algae growth and diagnostics. There's all this, you know, deep science work we were, we were working on. And, you know, I was pretty focused in the laboratory. One day, um, went to a uh, greeting card store to buy a greeting card for my grandmother, and it was this kind of image here that um, had one of those those moments um, where you pause and you go like, "What am I surrounded by?" and like, kind of curious about what what uh, what what is around us, and also why is a greeting card you know ten to twelve dollars from papyrus? And so I started to think about, well, it's it's paper, it's ink, there's coatings, there's inks inks and pigments on everything, and you know. I guess during grad school, I was very curious about where does everything come from. And so I also flash back to if you fly into San Francisco, this is the back bays. So this is right by the airport. If you fly in, you see these ponds that are really colorful. And, and these are algae. So I was kind of connecting some dots of, you know, what, what is ink and pigments? And I've seen colorful algae before. And, and you know, what can we do? So I went home. Um, after buying the greeting card with this, you know, basic idea of what is ink and could we use algae? Um, you know, high level, what is ink? It's about 20% colorant, so the pigment that makes it colorful, and 80% carrier. That could be water, that could be oil, that could be solvents, um, that can be a lot of different things. But um, I started to do some research, and there was really no one doing anything in the space of pigments related to bio-renewable content, so basically making a bio-based colorant. So I said, okay, I called up, called up my friend Steve, who I just showed you, we met the first day, and I said, hey, I got this idea. Let's turn algae into pigments and inks. And he said, you know, that sounds like a terrible idea. Um, tell me more. And I finally kind of sold him on that idea of like, let's just start messing around and see where this goes. At, at this point, we were both in interdisciplinary studies programs, studying entrepreneurship and, and business development and policy. And we said, hey, rather than doing MBAs, let's go out and start a business and see, see you know, learn how we do this. So um, first step we did, we started growing algae in Steve's bedroom up in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, that gave us a little bit of feedstock to start messing around with our first product, which I'll show you in a second. Um, since we were plugged into the university system, uh, we joined an accelerator program. And so this was a bunch of different starting about 10 different startups at CSU with undergrad and graduate students, um, which basically was like, what's an LLC? Uh, what's a patent, just re really basics. And then they also gave us about $4,000 of seed capital to get started. So that was our first kind of funds in the door. Um, they also gave us a um, first day, a um, uh, professional photos. And so this was, uh, I always joke, you saw the the very grainy um, picture of us on first day of PhD. And, and uh, this was about uh, nine years ago, and I'm still still using the photo. So um, they kind of made us professional, kind of got us introduced into the business world. Um, we did a couple of business pitch competitions. So putting together a deck about uh, like 10 slides about what's the problem, what's the solution. Um, so we won um, $10,000 was our first business pitch competition that we won. Um, we went on to win about... Um, probably about $100,000 more worth of business pitches around the country, including Department of Energy's um, big clean tech pitch competition. So um, the original idea um, that we were kind of growing algae in, in Steve's bedroom was to make this product. This is actually, I call it a very um, high-tech Petri dish. Um, so there's some moisture in there, there's some uh, nutrients, and we were actually taking living algae and we were actually uh, making an ink that would grow over time. And so um, we went from Steve's bedroom to kind of having a real laboratory in the Foothills campus at, at CSU. Um, so we had autoclave access and, and hood access, and we started to kind of develop our, our product. So um, this is what the final product ended up being, was kind of an ink that would grow over time when exposed to light. That could be a lamp light, that could be sunlight. So we could send you a card and you could color it and you can make ink appear at different times. And I'll show you a kind of a, a video here in a second of what that would look like. 
So in day one, there's a picture of uh, an owl with regular ink. Day two, an owl shows up. And then day three, it says, I'll always love you. And so you can actually communicate this message um, in a very fun, creative way. And so this was a kind of a fun product for us to use our creativity and um, uh, in, in, in kind of um, get algae out into the world and, and tell it a unique story. And so I did the very entrepreneurial thing where I would um, go around to various um, symposiums and conferences and trade shows and start talking about algae ink and to see people look look at me like a deer in the headlights of what, what are you talking about? But I think a lot of people thought it was neat. So um, there was some nights where I'd be going to bed and I would see us trending on the Weather Channel, for example, talking about this ink that would grow using algae. Um, and uh, we were voted the number one science gift uh, by Scientific America. So this was kind of dipping my toe into startup world um, and kind of understanding how to manage a budget, how to understand managing um, inventory of supply, um, and, uh, and then also putting together a kit. So there's things that you learn, like, you know, it doesn't seem like it takes that long to put together four different components, but when you're doing, you know, 3000 of them, it takes a lot of time. So yeah, learning the basics of product development. We bought a printer to print labels and package things. So we had literally trash cans that we were using, um, clean, I would say trash cans, um, you know, uh, filling them with product, shipping them out the door and scheduling pickups through uh, the um, United States Postal Service. So a lot of fun, a lot of uh, adrenaline, a lot of challenges, a lot of learning along the way. And um, one of our mindsets that we always had when we did this, and I kind of my mindset in life is that, you know, as long as we're learning something, good things are happening. So um, we just said the number one priority is we learned something for the day and it's been a successful day. And we're still talking about that, even with some, some bigger challenges, we'll say, okay, well, we know not what to do or what, what not to do. So, um, now and, and the next time we'll, we'll have, uh, some, some experience and insight. So that's been something that's kind of, um, stayed with us for a long time. As we're doing this product, we're putting it together. I kind of said, you know, I love that we're getting science out into the world. I love we're telling a new story and I love we're getting algae and kind of the mainstream um, usage and in and, and, uh, and media. But um, I think our, our bigger goal is to, you know, get into the commodity space where we can scale the product to make an impact related to sustainability and safety. And so as we were talking about this, we said, how do we do this? You know, is it even, is it even viable and how, where do we start? And um, I was talking to one of my design friends one day, and uh, he said, you know, here, here, take this screen, the screen for screen printing. And I said, I have no idea what screen printing is, but I don't think it'll work. And, you know, just kind of that, I'm um, usually quite positive. And, but I said, I, this, I don't think this designer knows what we, what we have or what we're working with. And so he said, just take it. So one night, you know, late, late at night, I was in the laboratory. I mixed some algae together, made a little bit of a basic ink and took the screen and, and made a screen print. And I pulled off the the little screen mesh part of the screen printer. And I said, oh my gosh, like we can actually make a, a regular traditional ink that we're, this is a hundred percent renewable. So it's water, it's um, like a agarose and it's essentially algae cells, which act as the pigments. And so we started to actually print products for local businesses and try to get into the market. So this was like uh, the place where I used to get my, my uh, haircut. Um, they would say, they said, yeah, we want to have cards that, you know, we already have, but we want to replace it with algae ink. So again, kind of getting into the world and figuring out how do we do this at scale and what's the good and the bad of what, what we're doing. So really the process that we did is we'd grow up algae in the laboratory. We'd harvest that algae. So concentrate it. We put it into a basic ink formulation, and then we could print it based on the screen that we had um, in in house. And so this was good. You know, screen printing is not what prints books and packaging. A little, maybe a little bit, but not not, not mostly. There's there's bigger industrial printers. So I called around to a bunch of different printers. Um, no one really wanted to talk to me that much. Um, they were all you know used very kind of conservative printers that have used the same ink for a very long time and. Um, and then there was one group that I reached out to that's uh, Eco Enclose, and this is uh, this is in Louisville, Colorado. Um, the owner is Kyle Wente. He had just bought the business. It's an eco packaging company, and I I pitched him this idea. I said, Hey, if we can make an ink that works on your printer, would you would you use it? And he said, Absolutely. Come in here today, bring your ink. And I'm like, Well, I don't have any ink yet, but you know, when we do, we'll we'll let you know. But it's good to know that you'd be willing to to test it, and you're interested in the product. So. Um, 
Uh, the other thing he said is we use a lot of black, you know, black and white are kind of the big colors that are used across fashion, packaging, and publication inks. And so he said, you know, if you can get a black, that'd be great because um, there's a lot of interest there. So we had two goals. One is make an ink that would work uh, at these commercial presses. And the other was, can we make a black that that is, you know, we kept hearing that over and over. If you get a black, you'll, you'll be good to go because there's so much black around in, in the world. And so skipping over um, a little bit of time and resources, we actually... Um, uh, made a, a black pigment derived from uh, algae material. And so um, this was a kind of a breakthrough for us. And the breakthrough really came by working in a multidisciplinary fashion. So we brought on a, kind of a really great chemist, but also kind of a, someone that had been in the ink world for about 25 years. And um, with my co-founder, myself and him, we kind of came up with these uh, strategies to uh, to make uh, a, a black pigment for inks. And so um, we made the black pigment. We made some very basic ink formulations. They're actually making it in his basement in New Hampshire originally. And so we went over, we went back to uh, eco enclosing that printer I just showed you. And we um, put the put the ink in the printer and we were able to print on the second time, not the first time, the second time we were able to print um, this box here. So this was our first box we ever printed. Um, on a corrugated material, and we knew the person that was running this brand, and so this was kind of our first. Hey, look what we can we can do here. So, um, what we, uh, you know, as we're learning, we're talking to a lot of people in the pigments, inks, all sorts of different materials spaces out there, and so um, what we realize that we're making is we're making an alternative to carbon black, and so carbon black is a black powder, and um, this is really where our business starts to. Um, uh, this is really where our business starts to take off and we start to realize how many different applications we can do. So if you pause and you look around your office or your home right now and you see anything that's black from your computer keys to your monitor, that's all colored with carbon black. The tires that you drive on has carbon black. That's why it's black. And so we started to realize, oh, there's a pretty big opportunity here and there's obviously a lot of interest in sustainability. So um, as I mentioned, a lot of things that are black in the world are colored by carbon black. Um, the problem that we identified was that it's obviously made from petroleum, so we're starting to hit on our goal that we set back in graduate school is to replace petroleum. It's got a large carbon footprint, carcinogenic, and governments are starting to uh, regulate it. So it's on Prop 65 in California, and there's a, uh, a, a lack of innovation. So it's been around for about 150 years, and you know a lot of the brands that we talk to say you know they want to tell a unique story um, about uh, materials. So um, our solution is instead of using petroleum, we use waste biomass. So it's carbon negative, it's renewable, it's innovative and safe. And so um, this is one of our algae suppliers. This is called Earthrise uh, in California. So we don't own this algae farm, we work with them. They grow algae, they extract molecules for their natural food business. And then there's this waste product that's produced. We take that waste product, we put it through our patented process to make it into a really nice black, pigment that's a replacement for carbon black. And so um, uh, the question off comes up often of like, why, why algae? So uh, introduction to algae, why are we using algae? Um, so the shape and the size is really interesting in terms of its morphology. It's very small in its um, size, which is very good for pigment. And it's a spherical shape, which is also good for making a pigment. Um, these are highly productive ponds, so they can grow enough biomass um, to make uh, uh, um, uh, tons and tons of material in a very small footprint. Um, and then it's a source of consolidated biomass. So you think of kind of traditional agriculture, they harvest corn maybe once, twice a year, there's huge fields. Um, algae is harvested every single day um, and it continues to divide daily. So um, it's a very nice consolidated source of material in a very small footprint of land. We don't need tractors to go around and collect all of the material like you need in traditional agriculture. Um, and then there's also a lot of waste products that are developed uh, or, or, or pr produced during the processing of this um, material. So in terms of the entrepreneurial journey, um, we used to get these little, little small, you know, few grams of samples sent to us, and then we would do some R and D at the bench top. And um, I always kind of joke because um, we had these buckets sent to us, and I'm thinking, wow, we're really scaling up. This is crazy. And then, you know, a few months later, we had a pallet sent to us, which um, I didn't even know how to move a pallet. I needed to get a pallet jack, and I was going, wow, I'm like really learning how to how to scale up and, and get into the product production world with this pallet jack and pallet of, of algae material. 
Um, and then we just kind of kept getting bigger and bigger. So then we went to, you know, very large pallets with super sacks. And um, just uh, uh, later, late last year, we had our first kind of true freight truck bring in some biomass. So the entire semi truck was full of um, was full of the biomass that we were using. So, yeah, it's been kind of fun to, to kind of see that scale and be a part of that. Um, you know, what do we do right now? Um, the value chain, you know, we work with these algae suppliers that have this, you know, waste biomass, think of it as green powder, um, and put it through our process, which is a thermal treatment right now, and we make a really nice black pigment, and we can put that black pigment into inks, um, and, and then we sell that ink to factories, and those factories typically work with brands, so think about like a Nike or a Patagonia, um, they, um, factories work with them, uh, and, and that's um, traditionally kind of what we do is do kind of brand pull through. So we work with the brands, um, a brand like Patagonia will tell their factory, hey, we want to use algae ink and living ink. And then the factory will work with us to, um, to use our product. Um, so that's kind of the sales cycle. All right. Um, and then, so what, what do we do right now? Uh, algae ink in the market. We've done all of the black hang tags uh, for Patagonia. Um, we'll be launching with a bunch more brands in that hang tag space. We've done footwear with multiple brands. We've done screen printing for all of these different uh, companies, Marmot, American Eagle. Uh, we did several million shirts with Nike. So uh, this is kind of the shirt that you're seeing there. That's our black pigment in our finished water-based ink. And then we sell that ink to a factory that puts it onto the shirt. Um, we do a lot of different packaging. So this is a bio-based, um, this is a bio-based water bottle. Um, we do corrugated, we do paper. Um, we're doing leathers. So we'll be launching leather products with a couple of luxury brands later this year. We're the factory that's the tannery can use our product like any other product out there. Um, so it's a very low barrier to entry. Um, we'll be launching cosmetics. We put the pigments into plastic master batches and even paints for some of the, the big bike companies and car companies that we're doing trials with. Um, so uh, we've also done um, shirts. So polyester and cotton, we've done um, dyeing projects. Uh, we're doing adhesives. So we're putting the black pigment into adhesives with some really big um, billion dollar industrial adhesive companies, foams, rubbers. Um, so um, we're working with shoe companies and we actually launched a project in the foam space with Beauty Counter. So um, like a cosmetics brush, um, that's our pigment that's been in there. Um, this is uh, um, uh, a project that we started with uh, PVH, so Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger uh, in the carrying group, putting the pigment into yarns. So we can put um, the pigment into a master batch that can get extruded into a yarn to be made into a lot of different products. So all I'm showing you here is that we can put this pigment into a lot of different applications. Again, if you look around your desk, you see an iPhone case or a wallet, um, that's something that we can do. So we've got a lot of brand interest. We typically do small trials to get started, and then we do pilot trials, and then we do bulk orders. And so um, we'll be doing um, uh, almost 100 million hang tags with one of the big apparel brands that'll launch really in the next couple of weeks. So we're starting to see groups go through that trial phase all the way through using our product across their entire supply chain. So why are brands interested in the product that we're producing? Um, it's carbon negative. So it's a 200% reduction in carbon emissions. That's the algae black pigment compared to a traditional carbon black pigment. So carbon's a big priority. Performance equivalent. So it's two things. One, it's really black. And, um, and the other is that it doesn't fade under UV light. So you can print a shirt, you could leave it outside for a long time, and it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay colorful. And that's why it's carbon negative, is because it's, um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't degrade, it doesn't change over time. It's very permanent. Um, innovative marketing. So we have uh, a logo um, that, uh, that we've been licensing to different groups, that little A drop next to the recycling. Now, maybe you've seen soy ink before in a hang tag, for example, or packaging. You know, now what we call our product is algae ink. Um, it's 100% renewable waste material, safe material. So we've done heavy metal testing and other testing um, uh, of compounds that are typically found in carbon black, and we're free of those. 
um, drop in replacement. And as I mentioned with the leather product, we can send our inks or pigments to factories. They can use it like they normally would, um, and they see really good results there. So two case studies, why are, again, why are groups working with us? One was Beauty Counter. Their challenge was they wanted to get any material that had Prop 65 label out of their supply chain. So again, our solution, um, we're not on Prop 65, we're safe. So they were able to use that pigment in the foam to achieve their goal. Um, we also work with a lot of bio-based leather companies. So groups that are like 98% bio-based, you know, whether that's mycelium mushroom material or nanocellulose material, um, they do a great job of making a nice bio-based leather. And then that last couple percent of colorant, um, they don't want to be petroleum. So we're a good solution for that as well. We did a full life cycle analysis with Colorado State University, which is really important right now in this world where nobody wants greenwashing. They want all the data to be there and backed up by third parties that actually know what they're talking about. So this is traditional carbon black pigment, 3.75 kilograms of CO2. Uh, per kilogram of pigment. Um, and then algae black is minus 4.16 kilograms per kilogram. So for every kilogram of algae black pigment we make, we're removing about four kilograms of CO2 equivalent. This is gets me excited just professionally and personally in terms of waking up and getting out of bed and trying to scale this because the more of it we use, the better. And I think that's one of the exciting things about um, what we're doing right now. Um, the carbon black market's a massive market. There's about 15 million metric tons of carbon black used around the world. If we were to replace all of that carbon black, we would have 120 million tons of CO2 removed annually. So um, just to give you some perspective, um, that's about, you know, Chevron is about 25 million metric tons of CO2 produced annually as a company. So um, we have, we're about an order of magnitude greater than that. So there, there is impact that can be made here. Um, you kind of have seen us go through this journey in this last a few minutes in terms of from very small lab scale to a little bit larger. Um, I think in 2020 was this moment we said, oh, we need to get our first kind of true manufacturing facility. And what does that look like? And, um, you know, I think uh, we didn't overthink it. You know, we actually got an old garage near Denver, Colorado that used to, you know, they used to change oil in this garage. And we set up uh, some lab equipment through a grant we received through the, through the state of Colorado. I uh, got big shelving units and started having inventory and, and, and running it like a real business, which was a learning experience um, and also um, a blast at the same time. So um, we went from having no equipment in the in the place to filling it up to the point where now we're actually out of this facility. We're in a um, we're in a six thousand square foot facility up in Berthoud, Colorado, and we've already filled that space up. Um, we make uh, pallets of product, both inks and pigments. Um, and so we ship that out to factories around the world. So Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, China, um, South Korea, um, all over the place. And so um, there's been a few moments on this journey that, you know, there's been some painful and challenging moments. And then there's been some of those moments where you go, oh, like it, it is worth it. And, um, you know, one of those moments was uh, it was a couple a couple of years ago, but went into the REI in downtown Denver. And um, they had these sandals that you can see in this picture. Um, they're bedrock sandals. And I started to look at the box and I saw um, algae ink and kind of the, the marketing done here. And that was one of those first moments where I saw something that, you know, at the time I was making with my own hands and saw it in the real world. And so that was that was definitely a satisfying feeling um, in the startup world. Um, we've recently launched with Nike now and footwear. So that's our black pigment that's been sprayed on the upper here and even the sole. And we'll be doing several other launches with, with um, footwear and apparel businesses later this year. Uh, we launched the first ever dyed t-shirt. So they've actually um, dyed this shirt with our pigment uh, on, uh, on hemp material. Um, so this was kind of a breakthrough in the dyeing space and actually using a bio-based pigment. Um, so I'm going to just kind of transition into the last part here, which is, you know, I get to this point and most people, um, no matter what their background is, like, hey, what about colors? That's great about the black. There's great opportunity there. What about colors? And we actually started the company thinking about colors. Um, and I'll tell you why. But um, what's cool about colors is that you get cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. 
and you can start to make a lot of different colors by mixing those colors. And so, um, again, the, the the natural palette that nature provides is pretty impressive. This is uh, this is these are different colors of algae and the different molecules that make those colors. So we've always been really interested in that. We've had colors in our laboratories really since day one, and part of that was because my co-founder at CSU was actually doing some molecular biology work focused on upregulating pigments. So zeaxanthin and astaxanthin. So it's kind of a reddish brownish color here and then kind of a yellowish color and the zeaxanthin. And so trying to um, get those different colors has been something that we've been working on. And we've also partnered with um, different organizations to help bioprospect um, while also doing some genetic work. Um, so this is um, some of the reds that we're looking at right now compared to these wild type green products. So yeah, uh, there is a future there. You know, there are some challenges as we scale it up in terms of uh, cost and performance, but we know what those issues are and we've got some solutions to do that. And we can grow up a little bit of algae to make this pigment and we, we can print out these colors to make browns and purples and oranges. So a lot of exciting opportunity in the color space um, and um, uh, I just had a call this morning with um, a big printer in Sri Lanka. It's like, send, send us the color. So there's a lot of need in the market as well. So last slide here, where are we going? You know, I, it's, uh, I, I showed you a lot of early on pictures of what we were doing, but we do have a really big vision at Living Inc. And this has been kind of fun to craft, but we're through phase zero, which is um, really to understand if we can validate the product market fit. So, you know, can we make a real product and does the market, does it fit into the market essentially? And the answer is yes. We have a lot of brand interest. We've made product work in the marketplace. So we're in phase one, which is driving the revenue to about $4 million dollars. Um, we've got a pilot plant, like I mentioned, in Colorado, where we do all the production right now. And the goal is to scale that production plant up in phase two of the business uh, to drive revenue to about $25 million. And then phase three is to expand globally. So co-locate where there's this different sources of, of biomass that we can use as, as starting feedstock. Um, to grow the business to um, you know over 350 million dollars. So this is uh, exciting, uh, exciting times uh, for us at Living Inc with a big vision, but also you know doing it at the same point in time. And so, yeah, appreciate your all everyone's attention, and that's kind of the journey in my last several years um, at Living Inc. And happy to answer any questions or be useful in any way. Awesome, thanks so much, Scott. And with that, we will jump into some of these great questions. So um, there's been some talk about tattoo ink um, being potentially toxic. Uh, do you think your ink could be used for tattoos? Um, the answer is yes. The, the pigment could definitely be used. We've had several different groups reach out to us. You know, I think it fits kind of in my mind in the cosmetic space, which there, it's, it's kind of, it's heavily regulated as far as I know, and there's certifications and quality control measures that are needed. So the answer is yes. Um, this is part of one of the challenges of my job right now is that like we had um, just this week, we had six different applications that we've never tried come into us. And we're like, do we want to pursue those applications or do we not? And what are the, the pros and the cons and the risks and opportunities? And so answer is yes. Um, we're not working on it right now, but I think it's something we can do in the future. Fantastic. A um, couple of kind of logistical questions. So um, algae have a larger particle size than carbon, and also the natural algae pigment is sort of a dark green, right? So how do you deal with the particle size issue? How do you deal with the color? Like what kind of solvents are you using to get this ink to where it's ready for printing? Yeah, so what we do right now is we do a thermal treatment of this uh, waste biomass. So that's how we get it black. And then there's some patents that we have, which are process patents, the things that we can do upstream and downstream to really make sure that it's a jet black color. Um, black looks pretty black when it's in a, um, if you fill a cup of black powder, for example. Once you start putting it into a really thin film layer, that's when you start to expose some of the weaknesses like color density. Um, and so, um, and then related to particle size, there's a, there's things that we can do downstream to shrink particle size. I think I've seen the smallest I've ever seen is about 200 nanometers in particle size of our pigment. Um, there's different types of algae, you know, we're using our, our raw materials, typically uh, probably 25 microns right now. And then there's and then there's some shrinking that goes on during the process and downstream uh, um, kind of grinding that we can do. 
but we also are working with things like E. coli as well, which you know we've seen thing, we've seen particle size as low as like two micron. That's just the starting feedstock. So that's kind of some thoughts on particle size. So I'm guessing that to use these inks in different formats, um, you might have to use different solvents and there's sort of different um, sort of manufacturing processes. Can you talk a little bit about that and then whether there are some applications that are more or less suited um, to the use of algae ink in terms of their production workflow? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, like when you think about even packaging, right? Like when you when you print on like a corrugated material or paper, it's very um, forgiving in the way that it absorbs some of that ink. So you don't need to have the perfect dry time. When you start printing on like a can or plastic, which has no absorbance, like it's pretty dialed in technology where you're getting like a really good color, a really good print application, and that you're getting good dry time and like cure on that product. So yeah, like corrugated is the place we started because it's a very forgiving um, material. Um, and then for even like the apparel link, like cotton's very forgiving as well. Once we start getting into like recycled polyesters or silks, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So, um, again, we've got some inks that are pretty flexible, um, in terms of what substrates it can be printed on. And then there's other, um, you know, like cans, we haven't even gone down that road because printed on metal is a little bit more, um, technically challenged. It's going to take some focus. So it's a really good question. So um, the Achilles heel of a lot of carbon neutral or even carbon negative products out there is that if they're being sort of manufactured in one place, you have to ship them um, around the rest of the world. And then, of course, there's a green um, footprint involved with that. So could you see this process being adapted so that we're using local biomass sources, local algae, um, so that we can sort of get rid of that transport problem? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that um, a lot of people um, don't really realize. Um, you know, I had a, one of my good friends in graduate school did the life cycle analysis of some of the um, beetle kill, pine beetle kill up in Colorado, where it was dying in the mountains. They said, oh, we can go turn that into product. Well, uh, the LCA was basically by the time you drive the truck up there, you collect it and bring it back like you've already just spent all the carbon there. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, you know, that's, again, one of the so that's one of our benefits of using microbial biomass is that we have this consolidated source of really high density growth. So we don't, again, we don't have to drive all over um, a massive cornfield to get our material. It's just coming right there in a consolidated way. To answer your question, Jenna, yes, we are uh, planning on co-locating, having kind of modular setup so that we're not doing any shipping of that raw material. Fantastic. Um, we've talked a lot about technical challenges. Tell us a little bit more about the commercial challenges for wide adoption. Yeah, yeah. It always seems easy, right? Like if you're at price parity and you're making a good product and everybody wants it, you know, I think one of the challenges we see in the material space is that you can have a brand like Nike who loves kind of innovation and doing sustainable things. And, but, you know, Nike doesn't buy raw materials. They work with factory partners who are all over the world that buy those raw materials from manufacturers like Living Inc. So it's kind of getting that whole supply chain uh, synced up. And you know that, that's related to performance, that's related to um, logistics and the timeline in order to get those raw materials all the way down to price point, right? And like, how do you dilute all those out over that entire supply chain? So that's been one of our challenges and one of the opportunities is to kind of, rather than work with 300 different factories right now, like identify 10 and really focus on those. Cause a lot of those factories work with everyone from Adidas to Under Armour to Nike. And so getting really good partners on board that are transparent about how they're using the product, what they're saying about the product and, and, and costing has been one area that we've spent a lot of time in the last 12 months and we're gonna to continue to focus on. So that's a challenge getting all the different people at the brands bought into doing change and getting you know the factory partners bought in because those factories are really good at making a lot of material and doing it for as cheap as possible. Their strength is not taking innovative materials from small Denver startup companies and integrating into global supply chains. <laughs> um, so it sounds like uh, you might be approaching cost parity, but haven't achieved cost parity. Where are you at in terms of cost? Yeah, so some of our inks in North America are within that range of price parity, although on the higher end. 
um, in Asia were typically two to three times more expensive right now in the ink space. Um, we do have a plan to get to price parity. Um, that really comes up to scale for companies like us. You know, once we actually build our own facility and that we're not using a contract manufacturer, we're able to lower the cost significantly while um, uh, also working with suppliers who have cheaper material for us to, to buy in that upfront feed stock. So yeah, we do have a, a plan to get to price parity. Um, but yeah, we're, we're more expensive right now. But for early adopters like a Patagonia and Nike, we're, we're definitely moving projects. What are the plans for mass adoption? Um, that hints a little bit at the co-location. So being able to produce the um, produce the black pigment at co-located facilities of, of biomass producers. Um, and so that we're doing that uh, on different uh, continents so that we aren't shipping things across the ocean or flying things. So um, that that's kind of the mass production. And then mass adoption is again, working with these different factories and for us, like the Nike footwear launches and some of the Patagonia launches that we've done, there's just a good indicator that we can we can do it at mass scale. And it shows that um, there's nothing really holding other brands back from you know doing these applications that we're launching with. So a lot of what we're doing is kind of showing that we can do it and and, and proving it out. Um, and then you know, starting to kind of see that snowball effect where once we launched with Nike, obviously we got a lot of emails from other groups that same day saying, hey, how do we work with you? So we're going to continue to kind of do those launches. And you know, we were talking to someone in the ink world um, recently and they were saying when water-based inks first came out, everyone said, oh, you know, who wants to use that? And no one wants to use it. It's more expensive. And now everybody uses um, water-based inks in the pack packaging space. So um, I think that's where, we're, you know, the goal is to kind of be the, the common black ink out there that's used um, in the future. And then also obviously roll these colors out. So I think I'm back. I have an, another question for you. Um, so you told an interesting story in terms of how you guys got started. In hindsight, do you have any advice for other entrepreneurs who are thinking of starting companies in this green biotech space? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the things that I think I learned, I worked at an undergrad, I worked at a couple of companies that raised a lot of money and they looked really good externally. But when I started to get there, I was going, oh, there's like a lot of technical challenges. And so the way that we started Living Inc. was kind of countering that, right? So saying, we're going to go prove the technology. We're going to go prove the LCA. We're going to go prove that we can scale it. We're going to prove that we've got the feed stock. And now we're in this position where, we need to improve that external facing part of the business. <laughs> so looking back, um, I think I would have spent more on kind of getting marketing and getting that story right from day one um, and getting the brand right from day one, because, you know, whether it's a factory we're working with or a brand or an investor, like it matters. And I think um, part of my frustration came back just from my past. But looking back, I think that's where something that I would have done is get that all lined up because it will go a long ways, um, you know, going forward. And so you can always look good and then you go figure it out. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's one of my learning lessons. We did get a lot of grants. So we've got National Science Foundation grants, Department of Energy grants. Um, I don't think I would do that differently. But, you know, for us, it's taken time because we we didn't go out and raise $20 million. So, so far, it's working out, but it's just taken longer than if we had raised a bunch of money and we hired a big team and we would not do it. That being said, a lot of what we do in innovation takes time, right? Sales cycles are long for these big brands. Innovation takes time. And so um, I don't think I'd change that. But, you know, ask me in a couple of years and I might have a different answer. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, thank you, everybody, for the great questions. Uh, we're going to wrap up today. Um, thanks again for your time, Scott, and for sharing a great story with us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jenna. Bye, everyone.